Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National, where tonight will be a little different. We're taking your questions about terror. What's on your mind? What haven't you heard the answers to? And we'll put those queries to the people who should know the answers. You've been reaching us all day by email, Facebook, and YouTube. Great questions, tough questions, for a national conversation on terror. And we wanted them answered in no small part because of what happened in London. That's where we begin with the news of the day. Police reveal more about the attackers. And as his city mourns yet again, we talk to London's mayor. We're not gonna allow anybody to fuel division or to divide our community. More on the Canadian killed in the attack. She grew in her depth of sensitivity to how important this work is. How her memory is driving acts of kindness. And less than a month away from Canada's big celebration, how secure is this country to similar threats? Cowardly and evil, two of the words used by London's mayor to describe the latest deadly attack on his city. This evening, as hundreds gathered in solidarity, Scotland Yard named two of the men who inflicted fear and pain on the British capital. 30-year-old Rashid Redawan was born in either Morocco or Libya, and 27-year-old Karam Butt was a British citizen born in Pakistan. He was known to police and MI5, but neither had any intelligence warning about this attack. A third attacker has not yet been identified. Margaret Evans has more on the day's developments from London. Britain's flags lowered in mourning once more, and a vigil along the Thames for the victims of yet another terrorist attack. The third to strike this country in three months. The mayor of London delivered a message to those who would attack his city. Your perverse ideology has nothing to do with the true values of Islam. And you will never succeed in dividing our city. They've just finished holding a minute silence here along the Thames and now people are laying wreaths and lighting candles. Lots of signs in the crowd say unite and turn to love. What they hate is us mixing and mingling. What they hate is us uh, having civil liberties and human rights. What they hate is us enjoying each other's companies. And what they hate is the fact that we don't just tolerate each other, we celebrate, embrace and respect each other. Among those being remembered, 30-year-old Canadian Christine Archibald, the first of the dead to be identified. Canada's High Commissioner to London, Janice Charette, represented the government at the ceremony. Our sympathies and our our prayers and love really go out to her, her family, her fiance, uh, Tyler, who is still here in London. You know, th this couple came to London to, to visit, to, to, to enjoy uh, a beautiful city and uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, had a tragic end. Today, police named two of the three suspects shot dead by police on Saturday night after their short but bloody rampage on and near London Bridge. 30-year-old Rashid Redouan is thought to be Libyan or Moroccan and to have lived at one time in Ireland. 27-year-old Kuram Butt is a British citizen of Pakistani origin, perhaps the more troubling of the two because he was known to British counter-terrorism police. The group display the black flag of Islam. But appeared in a documentary about British jihadists and was reported as a potential threat to the country's anti-terrorism hotline. He was not, apparently, considered a threat at the time. Another bridge on the Thames. The flowers here faded, but not the memory of those killed in March when Khalid Massoud drove into four pedestrians with his car before killing a policeman with a knife. Today, barriers went up on three London bridges to protect pedestrians from a similar attack, reassuring to some, if perhaps a bit late. Well, it might feel a little bit more relaxed, to be honest with you, to know that uh, you know, the authorities are trying to do something about these terrible atrocities. 
Masood was also known to the police, as was the Manchester bomber who killed 22 people last month. You cannot protect the public on the cheap. With just the three days to go before an election, possible. security has become a hot issue. The British Prime Minister, Theresa May, under fire for cutting police numbers during her time as Home Secretary. Criticism she rejects. We have been protecting counter-terrorism policing. Uh, we've provided funding for an uplift in armed policing. We have, uh, from 2015, we're protecting police budgets. Sadiq Khan disagrees. It's a fact I'm afraid of the last uh, seven years. The Conservative government has cut a considerable amount of money from London's budget. It is for this country a time of deep reflection and of sadness. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Yesterday, Donald Trump criticized Sadiq Khan's response to the attack in London. Today, the president doubled down. Sunday morning, the U.S. president tweeted at least seven dead and 48 wounded in terror attack. And mayor of London says there's no reason to be alarmed. Khan's original message was referring to the increased police presence in the city. Today, Trump said that was a pathetic excuse sold by the media. In response, Khan said he's too busy to respond to the president, but that Londoners won't let anyone, including Donald Trump, divide their communities. Those who knew Christine Archibald are remembering the B.C. woman as kind and generous. She loved helping others and giving back to her community. Now there's a movement to carry on that work in her memory. Carolyn Dunn has more on that. In Christine Archibald's hometown, the local food bank is collecting donations in her name. We can't, you know, let the radical few overtake the love of what we have in communities. And, and I think that's a really strong message. And I think um, a, as a tribute to their daughter, we should all look for more Chrissies in the world. Christine Archibald and her fiancé, Tyler Ferguson, had been living in the Netherlands. They were enjoying a weekend in London when the attack happened. Archibald's grieving family asked her to be honoured this way. Volunteer your time and labour or donate to a homeless shelter. Tell them Chrissy sent you. Little did they know, Chrissy sent me would soon be trending on Twitter. People donating to animal shelters, to food banks and soup kitchens, and pledges to volunteer. In London, a cafe offered coffee on the house for first responders. All because Chrissy sent me. Covenant House for Homeless Youth and Children in Toronto was one of many charities to see a spike in donations today. There's so much good that a person like her has done in our country and that she's given back and that there are others who can also step up as she has. I think that's incredible. Good deeds were important to the 30-year-old. She graduated from Mount Royal University's social work program and spent two years working at a Calgary shelter for homeless people in the grips of addiction. She grew in um, her depth of sensitivity to how important this work is. Um, you know, so she, she left knowing that and um, uh, left knowing, um, you know, the value of the work. Assistant Professor Peter Choate says the tight social work community is grieving and sympathizing with the family. It brings into the life of that family uh, a moment that uh, completely changes their destiny and their path and their understanding of what the world is about. The Archibalds say they're honoured by the outpouring of good deeds and believe their daughter would be too. Her fiancé Tyler echoed that with a donation of his own, saying his beautiful fiancé would want nothing else than to have a little bit of good come out of this tragedy. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. More details are starting to emerge about the other victims. 32-year-old Londoner James McMullen is believed to have been killed after he left a bar to have a cigarette. This morning we received news from the police that my brother's bank card was found on one of the bodies from Saturday night's brutal attack. A French citizen is also believed to be among the dead. Dozens of other people are recovering in hospital, including journalist Jeff Ho, who was attacked after he tried to break up what he thought was a fight. Australian Candace Hedge was having a drink at a bar when she was slashed across the throat. And 23-year-old Daniel O'Neill has a 17-centimeter wound from his stomach to his back. 
With all the coverage from London and Manchester just two weeks ago, it may be hard not to wonder how safe Canadian cities are, whether attacks like those could happen here. With big events planned around Canada 150 and summer fair like the Grand Prix, security is front of mind. But as Catherine Cullen tells us, there are some important differences to consider. A moment of silence in memory of the victims of the attack in London. As they reflect on the lives lost in London, there are security questions to reflect on too. In recent weeks, the UK alone has seen an attack near its parliament, then the bombing in Manchester, and now this London Bridge attack. Canada's public safety minister says threat levels here will remain at medium. There is uh, uh, no information available at this time to Canadian authorities that would cause that level to change. Still, security experts have to contemplate how to prevent an attack when it can happen in so many different ways. Just recently, we've seen knives, vehicles and explosives used to kill. The only really way to prevent it is to have intelligence beforehand. While barricades and other checks and balances can help, that alone isn't going to stop an attack, says this former strategic analyst with CSIS. In the absence of prior intelligence, um, what's a so-called small-scale attack, or I would call it a simplistic method attack, is next to impossible to stop. Ralph Goodale says sharing intelligence intensifies after an attack. But it's at a very strong level all the time to make sure that we know what we need to know and that we're in a position to respond effectively. While attacks in Canada are rare, they do happen. In 2014, there was the shooting in Ottawa, just days after the hit-and-run killing in Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu. The most deadly attack in recent years was the Quebec City mosque shooting, where the victims were six Muslim men. With massive celebrations planned for Canada's 150th birthday, there are questions about keeping everyone safe. We uh, continue to uh, look at every necessary measure to ensure that Canadians uh, can be safe and can have confidence uh, in their safety. Already this year, officials in Ottawa changed their New Year's Eve plans after a truck drove into a Christmas market in Berlin. We had to go and put front end loaders at all cross section streets so that the, the young kids carrying the torches were not going to be harmed or, or run over. But ultimately, the odds of an attack in Canada are much lower than in Europe or the UK, says Gursky. They have thousands of people who become radicalized and a percentage of those who move on to actually become violent terrorists. We have hundreds. They have thousands. Right there, that's an order of magnitude difference. The Prime Minister says it's important that Canada Day celebrations remain open and inclusive as part of celebrating what it means to be Canadian. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. People living in Qatar have reportedly started stockpiling food tonight after some of the Arab world's biggest powers cut ties with the tiny Gulf country. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain announced the action this morning in a coordinated move. They accused Qatar of supporting extremists in the region, including the so-called Islamic State and the Muslim Brotherhood. Air, land and sea links to the country have been blocked. Qatar imports nearly all of its food, with about 40 percent coming from Saudi Arabia. The move comes two weeks after Donald Trump's visit to the region, during which he demanded Muslim states help in the fight against terrorism. Qatar says the move is based on lies and denies it backs militants. Well, we'll get back to other news a little bit later in the program, including a surprising chill on a hot housing market. But right after this break, we'll answer your questions in our national conversation on terror. All right, those of you watching on Facebook, we're in a commercial break, and this one is about two and a half minutes. We're just getting organized for the uh, question and answer session, getting some of our guest panelists here in Toronto, getting them seated in their uh, positions and we have guest panelists also in Ottawa and Detroit and you'll recognize some of these people who have been on our program before. We've been getting questions from you on our various different social platforms throughout the day and we're going to try as best we can to answer them in as directly as we can. There have been a lot of questions already. We want to keep that going throughout this program so don't be shy. Uh, send in uh, either on uh, Facebook or over on, on this mark now. Um, or on uh, YouTube, use the comments section 
and uh, send us the things that are on your mind about this whole issue of terror, not just the London attacks, but in general, the issue of terror and how it's being uh, dealt with. Uh, so as I said, don't be shy, send them in. We'll try to answer as many as we can, and ones that we can't answer uh, tonight, we will try and get back to you in the, uh, in the next couple of days with an answer. A lot of questions will be similar, already have been, so we'll be picking one of those uh, that kind of represents uh, a lot of the others. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to uh, your question and all this. Um, what else can I warn you of? Uh, we got about a minute left in the commercial. And, um, you know, if you've been watching our Facebook Live hits over the last uh, month or six weeks or so, you know it's a little bit rock and roll. Uh, which way, Fred? This way? You're there. Okay. They're just getting me shifted so everything looks appropriate. Um, and this will probably be the same way. We're going to uh, uh, try and just bounce back and forth from uh, question to question. A little more. How's that? Too much. How's that? See, so you at home, now you're, you know exactly what directors do to uh, what they call the talent on camera as they try to set up for all this. Okay, so we're uh, 20 seconds away, roughly from coming back to uh, our audience watching across CBC television. Those, of course, who are not, not watching the hockey game at the moment. Um, 15? This way? This is what you put up with. Okay, here we go. Three seconds, and we're back. Well, we've all seen the stories, witnessed the horrific consequences. London, Manchester, Paris, Kabul, Berlin, Ottawa, 9-11. The details all fresh in our minds, and it's clear that for many of you, there are questions you feel are not being answered. Tonight, we try, with some people with the backgrounds to help. Joining us from Ottawa, Stephanie Carvin, who can talk about counterterrorism. From Detroit, Saeed Khan, whose focus tonight is Muslims in the West and identity politics. And here in Toronto, Samantha Nutt, who will answer questions on homegrown terrorism. And Mubin Sheikh, who can talk about intelligence and de-radicalization. So let's uh, get started with the first question that we've got uh, from you for tonight. And it uh, came in on Twitter, actually. J.M. Davis asked this, and Stephanie, uh, I'll ask you to try and answer it. The question is, should Canada develop a similar strategy or media plan that the UK has with its run, hide, and tell? And just to explain this, if you haven't heard of it already, on Friday night or Saturday night when the attacks happened in London, uh, the authorities in the UK put this out on, on Twitter, this symbol, run, hide, and tell. And this was kind of the... Um, uh, the advice that uh, police were giving and other uh, civic authorities throughout London, if you find yourself in a situation where uh, it looks difficult, there's been an attack or there's something going on, run first, then hide, and then tell. Get on the phone, tell somebody. Um, Sheila, is this, uh, do we have, does Canada have a plan? Stephanie, sorry, does, this, uh, does Canada have a plan like that? As far as I'm aware, Canada does not have a plan. What I have seen in the past are uh, basically using the U.S. version of the program, which is actually run, hide, fight, that they actually use in businesses and government offices in case there is a shooter in the building. I think anything that can promote resilience without promoting fear is something that should be adopted in, in order to, uh, you know, this wouldn't just be useful in a terrorist attack. It could also be a mass shooting incident, for example. But, you know, at the same time, you don't want it to be a way to kind of spread more panic than I think is what would be needed. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, next question is for uh, Sam, and it comes from uh, Cindy Blackstock. Uh, who is, uh, is a good friend of ours, who uh, has been a guest on this program, actually. Studies show you are more likely to be killed by lightning than a terrorist. How do we put the risk and investments in context? Sam. 
Peter, I think that's actually a great statistic to consider, uh, and, I, and I think it's critically important. When you look at where terrorism is happening throughout the world, there, it is 50 times greater still in countries that are in Asia, in uh, the Middle East, in Africa, than it is in Europe and the Americas. I mean, even in the last week, 100 dead in Afghanistan, more than 30 killed in an explosion in Baghdad. So we need to put that context, at least the European, the Western world context, into a certain amount of a, of a reality check. Um, it, is, it is a risk. It is something we need to take very seriously, but at the same time, we shouldn't overstate that risk because, frankly, that does play into the hands of those who would who would seek to unsettle us and to uh, to impose that kind of fear. All right, Mubin, here's one for you. Um, Darren Ilk asks this: What is being done to track Caucasian terrorists, like the man from the Quebec mosque attack? We we, we do tend to always hear about uh, the non-Caucasians who are being tracked. What's being done to track Caucasian? Well, I mean, the uh, intelligence services and police services use the same tools, uh, regardless of what group it is. Uh, there's no, there are no special surveillance t uh, tools for Muslims only and for white people something else. So uh, they're using the exact same tools. Uh, it can range from uh, human intelligence gathering, actual spies in groups, monitoring social media, intercepting communications, the whole gambit. Okay. Uh, Saeed, here's one for you. Uh, DK Speed uh, asked this via Facebook. Don't you think it's about time we close our borders now? Don't you think we should slow this immigration policy down? Do we want to end up like Europe? Um, you've seen this debate play out in, in your country, Saeed, and now here's somebody suggesting uh, that the same uh, issue should be debated here in Canada. How do you, uh, how do you react to that? Well, to, uh, to go along with what Sam was talking about regarding statistics, uh, even in the United States, the chances of uh, being killed by a refugee or by an immigrant are far, far less than being killed by somebody who is a born and bred American citizen. We saw this as the case in Colorado where a young man uh, shoots up a, a movie theater or, for example, a, a kindergarten in, uh, in Connecticut. So this idea then that this is a problem that will go away simply by going ahead and putting up uh, walls and uh, by uh, excluding immigrants uh, from coming to the country, that may solve one problem that isn't in front of us right now, but that's not doing anything about feeling safer when it comes to not only homegrown uh, American citizens, in the case of my country, but also a rising tide of white supremacy and uh, hypernationalism, which is a bigger threat by far. Uh, next question comes from, uh, from Twitter. And I, I, I got to tell you, this is one we debate a lot here in our own newsroom, so I'll, I'll try to handle it for, for us. Uh, Vasuki asks, why do media pay attention to certain terror attacks while ignoring others? Um, this is a good question because there are terror attacks, I was going to say every day, They're not every day, but very frequently. Uh, certainly some in parts of the world that don't get the attention, others do. We, uh, you know, we talk obviously about the ones in London and Paris, and Berlin, Ottawa, Washington, New York. Uh, last week we did, we did a, a fairly lengthy piece on an attack in Kabul where nearly 100 people uh, died. But... Having said that, there are lots of other attacks, terror attacks, that happen in different parts of the world uh, that we don't uh, report on every day, or if we do, it's, it's fairly short. It's what we call a copy story, a couple of lines that I read as opposed to a report. That's partly because, um, you know, we don't always have people in all parts of the world to cover these things. There have been a number of terrorist attacks in the Philippines in the, in, in the uh, last few years, for sure. Uh, we sent Adrian there just a, a couple of months ago, Adrian Arsenault, about a month ago, and she did a whole series reporting on the difficulties that the Philippines uh, has had. Now, having said all that, um, you're right, we don't. And we have to re-examine how we handle those things because there is an inequity in the way we report on different parts of the world when it comes uh, to terror. All right, let me uh, move on to the next one. This one is for Sam um, from Facebook. Kathy, I'm sorry, Kathy, I, I may get your name wrong here. In, in Govan, my daughter is flying to London tomorrow. Is this safe? Now, you were, you were just there a couple of days ago. All of us pass through London fairly frequently, but you're the last one there. Is it safe? 
Yeah, I think my answer to Kathy would be that, uh, in fact, the morning after the Manchester bombing, I got on a plane to London with my 12-year-old son in tow because I was already booked to speak at uh, to speak at Cambridge. And and um, I mean, look, things can happen at any time. It's important to remain vigilant and to be cautious and to be alert. And that's true whether you're traveling in London or Paris or Brussels or even in in Toronto. We all, I think, right now, given the state of the world, need to be on guard, um, but not live in a state of paranoia and fear. And um, you know, I think one of the most challenging things for me arrived in England. I spent many years living in England uh, over the last couple of decades and uh, you know, it's just to see the, the heavy police presence, the armed presence, guys with assault rifles, well police with assault rifles and it's just a constant reminder that that, uh, that the world is changing, it's shifted and um, you know I think for all of us the one thing that we can hope for is that our children will still be able to experience uh, the, the right to travel and, and the freedom that comes with that because it's critically important. You, so get on that plane is what I would say. You tried to take your son to Buckingham Palace for the changing of the guard and on that day it we'll was cancelled because, in fact, we arrived and there had been a, a, a guy who had been arrested wielding a knife just a few minutes before. So, um, again, you have to be on your guard, but I think it's really important that we send that message of, of resilience, especially at this moment in time. All right. Stephanie, this one's for you. Nick Gaming via YouTube asks, at what point do we give up privacy for security and how far do we go on that? I think that's a very difficult question and one certainly we've seen the Liberal government uh, dealing with uh, in the response to the Green Paper it put out. It, it released a report about a month ago and the consensus was that actually people who are interested in this topic, people who responded to the government's questions are not interested in giving up privacy uh, going forward. And, you know, mass surveillance is not particularly useful for intelligence collection and analysis. What you want are targeted collection on, you know, a set of risk factors, risk factors that are showing that someone may in fact be mobilizing, when in fact, you know, with this kind of mass surveillance, what you're actually getting is just a lot of data and not a lot of quality analysis. And, and that can actually confuse things as opposed to uh, help things. So I think, you know, there needs to be a, a focus here on protecting privacy. That's certainly important. And I think to the extent that some people want to give up those privacy rights, don't necessarily consider the way that intelligence analysis works with uh, domestic uh, extremism. The fact that you want uh, to, you know, be more targeted rather than this kind of mass surveillance that, that might be seen as a panacea through algorithms or what it be, but really can sometimes just create uh, more noise. All right. Moob, when you were in the intelligence business, but I saw you agreeing with what Stephanie was saying there. I've got to take a break in 30 <laughs> seconds, but you, you were, had agreement on that. Yeah, wide net spying doesn't work. Uh, the NYPD tried it, uh, and outright came out and said it doesn't work. Uh, targeted collection is the only way to go. All right. We're going to take that quick break and then more of your questions. So keep them coming in. Stay with us. All right, Facebook Live people, see, we get to as many of your questions as we can. We've got two more sections. We'll do this uh, commercial break. Well, in fact, why don't we, can we try and squeeze a couple of questions in here? Because we've got a four-minute break here. Or do you want to save them all for the full show? Okay, seeing as this is a break that's going just to social media, moving, why don't you try this one for those who are watching on Facebook and YouTube uh, right now? Uh, Dan Anzarud asks, how should we be using social media to help prevent terror? We hear so much about how social media is being used by, by ISIS and other groups to influence uh, their, those who are maybe joining them. Uh, how should we use it to prevent terror? You know, from, uh, for three years, 2013, 14, and 15, I was on Twitter and Facebook with ISIS members uh, almost every day. Uh, there are a number of things that can be done. Um, first and foremost is for the general public, uh, the, for the general public to engage in resiliency narratives, as Samantha was saying, uh, to understand that well, let's not repeat what terrorists are saying. If terrorists are saying, listen, you know, Islam equals terrorism, well, then we shouldn't also reinforce them and say, yeah, Islam equals terrorism, because it alienates Muslim assets that you need uh, to sign up. Uh, and to really go after extremists. Another way to prevent it is education. I mean, the, uh, the internet is a wonderful thing. I mean, it's an amazing place for people to learn. And, uh, you know, we need to create products for children to, to, um, uh, to, to consume online so that it's not just one thing that they're seeing all the time. 
Sam? On that? I agree wholeheartedly with that. Those counter narratives are incredibly important and for people to feel as if they are being included uh, in things because what we know is that sense of alienation, that victimization, that that aggrievement can actually be one of the one of the major drivers and one of the sort of dividing factors when it comes from having ideology and then acting on that particular ideology. But I do want to hit on uh, a point that Saeed mentioned earlier which I think is incredibly important and we've seen this particularly in Britain over the last few years that when we have uh, extremist acts like this there is a, uh, a sort of a, a, reci a reciprocal acts that tend to happen um, and we have seen an increase in hate crimes in particular in the UK uh, targeting uh, Muslim organizations and groups associations um, everything from you know verbal abuse and assault to online harassment and those have gone up significantly over the past couple of years they started with the with the Rigby attack uh, the the uh, young officer who was stabbed mm -hmm. and uh, and that has gone unreported unfortunately and things like that to Mubin's point that when when you have that sense of alienation when you have that sense that people are being singled out that they're being persecuted uh, that can feed exactly the kind of ideology and resentment that ISIS tends to hang on to and and use to its advantage all right there's bonus coverage for Facebook <laughs> viewers we got a minute before we're rejoined by the full network side do you want to pick up on those two points before I uh, uh, send it back to the full network. Sure. I mean, what we found happening in Portland, Oregon, uh, just a few days ago, is uh, is is part of this longer chain of events. And uh, some people may want to go ahead and stop the uh, the chain and uh, stop the whole cause and effect aspect. But we find that this is uh, unfortunately a rather endless uh, and seamless continuum. Of, uh, of action. Now some of it is action and some of it is reaction, but then you also find that there are causes outside this binary of Muslim, non-Muslim that are rising up. Again, when it comes to the rise of uh, white supremacy, when it comes to this whole Vinlander uh, movement, uh, uh, neo-Nazism, uh, this is a rather frightening uh, mm -hmm. moment that we're facing because okay. there really is no pushback. All right, Saeed, I got to uh, stop you there. We're going to be rejoined by the uh, full network in four seconds. All right, welcome back. We're back with your questions, so let's, uh, let's get right back to it. Uh, Saeed, this one's for you. It's from Justin Ballack. Asks via YouTube, I'm an air cadet from Kitchener, Ontario, and I was wondering, is Canada really that more safe than the UK? So you're watching from the outside, Saeed, and what do you right. think? Well, I mean, I can only see uh, what I see from Canada and from the CBC about what's going on. And uh, uh, it seems as though it's much safer than the UK. That's not to say that the UK is a bedlam of, uh, of a lack of safety. Again, we have to really contextualize and uh, make proportionate these incidents. They are still um, far, far fewer than, for example, even what happened in the UK during the Troubles, a time when I was living in the UK and there were always threats by the IRA, bomb threats as well as actions that were taken out. What we find is that, uh, of course, everybody now is internalizing a lot of what's going on thanks to technology, thanks to advanced communications. Uh, literally something that happens half a world away is felt as though it's happening next door. So that is creating a perception or a misperception that perhaps Canada is somehow less safe than other parts of the world. And as Sam aptly put, there's a lot more that's happening in places like Asia and in Africa than are happening in the West still. All right. Stephanie, um, this one's for you from Twitter. Jane G. V. McCaughey, how do uh, the media and the government responses to Saturday's attack in London compare to those in 2005? That was the 7-7 attacks in London. And I'm asking you, um, uh, Stephanie, because you were living there at the time, and what, is, what does this say about security perceptions today compared with then? Well, certainly in 2005, the UK was not a stranger to terrorism. It had, of course, lived through the uh, IRA bombings that had taken place for a number of decades beforehand. I think what the shock of 2005, though, was the idea that 
jihadi terrorism wasn't necessarily something that came from without. It could also come from within, and it could be very deadly. So you basically had a kind of foreign fighter attack, individuals who'd gone abroad, gotten training, and were able to conduct an attack. And I think that was, was what was so shocking. So to compare that to today, you know, sadly, even though the UK has had a number, uh, sorry, a, a fairly good track record up until this year with regards to preventing violent extremist plots, uh, you know, we're kind of used to seeing these images now, whether in Paris or Brussels. So, uh, so I think we can actually say that, you know, we can contextualize these attacks a little bit differently, and we're seeing that in the media as well, in, in terms of uh, the messages being sent, even if uh, some of the images are in fact gory. All right. Sam, um, you can pick up on this because it, it, it reflects some of the comments we've all been making tonight here. Patrice Robinson asks via Facebook, what precisely does be on guard and remain vigilant look like? What are you suggesting that a regular person do to stay, stay safe in this climate? I, I may not be the best person to answer that question, Peter, because I've been going in and out of war zones for 20 years. So I'm always the kind of person who is looking, uh, when I sit down, to, I always want to know where the nearest exit is. I always want to know what my, my strategy will be uh, should something happen. And I don't think that's a very normal, nor is it a healthy way to live your life. Um, but what I would say is, and it sounds like a cliche because it is the tagline that gets used around the world, but if you see something, say something. You know, if, you, if something looks as if it's, uh, if somebody's looking uh, as if they're uh, about to carry something out, if they're... Uh, behaving in a way that's particularly aggressive. If you see a car that's veering towards you, um, just just remain alert, remain vigilant. And unfortunately, that's hard to do at this uh, this day and age. You know, a lot, a lot of us we're looking at our phones, we're distracted, we're thinking about other things. But um, you know, it's I, it's not that it's a guarantee. Um, but by paying attention, you don't know. Uh, you might pick up on something, and it might change your life. Yeah, and I, you know, and I don't think what you've been doing for 20 years is a bad thing for for most people to think of. I mean, I, I know that I still, when I got on a plane, and I've been flying for 50 years, um, that, uh, that I always look, well, what would I do if something happened? Where would yeah. I go? Where's the nearest exit? All those kind of little things. And you can think about that, whether you're in a plane or a restaurant or, or, or what have you. Uh, Mubin, here's one for you. Uh, Josh Michael asks via Facebook, does the Canadian government spend enough money on counterterrorism? On counterterrorism, uh, I mean, it depends on, you know, traditionally we understand counterterrorism as being uh, the, the hard approach. Um, countering radicalization should be separated from counterterrorism. Uh, so when it comes to counterterrorism, look, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm biased in the sense that I'm uh, pro-national security. Uh, and so, look, we can always spend more. Uh, and that's, that's the reality. We really can. Um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, upping... Um, uh, special forces capabilities specifically to protect Canada, like JTF-2 units, um, uh, uh, and also what our, our forces are doing overseas. You know, do they have the equipment they need? I mean, that might fall under defense, but counterterrorism is a part of defense. So we okay. can always spend more. Saeed, here's one for you from Twitter. Paul Bruce asks, when are we going to stop aiding and abetting terrorists by arming Saudi Arabia, and you know, the, 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 uh, your country is doing that, Canada's doing that. Well, and, and in quite large numbers uh, after the latest uh, trip by uh, mm -hmm. President Trump to well, the region. Was it 100 billion? Uh, it was. Uh, I mean, a lot of letters of intent, to be fair, uh, were signed, so I don't know how much of that is going to go through, but between the UAE and Saudi Arabia over the last several years, billions of dollars have been spent. And you mentioned earlier in the broadcast about how now both of those countries are uh, uh, freezing ties with Qatar, so they're having a bit of a skirmish in their own backyard. But I think this is such an important point to recognize the connectedness, not only of the world itself when it comes to one region and another, but also when it comes to policies that then create an action and a reaction. So here we are in the case of Saudi Arabia, particularly, which has of course been accused of uh, spreading at least the ideology of extremism. And now, of course, with social media and the internet, it has literally gone viral. The idea then of how policies either help promote this inadvertently or explicitly is a big challenge that we're facing. And when the public actually does speak up uh, to their respective governments, oftentimes these fall on deaf ears. All right. Got to leave it there for a moment. We're going to take another break, but we will be back. Keep those questions coming. We're going to take that quick break, then answer more of your questions.
All right, still on Facebook Live, we have some more questions. Uh, uh, okay, we're, let's run this one around. We have three and a half minutes to see how many people we can get in on this. Stephanie, you start. Keep in mind when we go to that next block on the air, if I can ask all the guests, keep their answers short, um, or brief, focused, because uh, we're going to quickly run out of time. We've got tons of questions. Thank you for all of the questions you've been sending in. Brock Warner from Twitter asks, is the immediacy of social media and a 24-hour news cycle increasing awareness and empathy, or is it desensitizing the public to acts of terror? This is a good question. Stephanie. That is a good question. I would suggest that it, we're, we're kind of seeing both, but with the different, uh, in the one hand, you're seeing the social media being used to rally around, uh, say, for example, the Canadian victim for a very good causes. Uh, and yes, um, you know, there's also the bad effect as well. In 1998, Al Qaeda was per perhaps a few hundred highly radicalized elite individuals. Today, I don't want to overestimate the strength, but we're now dealing with tens of thousands of individuals. And we can't deny the fact that social media has played a role in spreading narratives. At the same time, we're increasingly seeing you know, uh, extremists going from these social media platforms to more encrypted message service, and this is why we're also having a debate about encryption as well. I'm interested in how you all feel about the 24-hour the news cycle, too, whether that's hurting or helping. Ruben? There's a quote I'll never forget, and I'll spit it out now. Media gives terrorism a longevity it might not otherwise enjoy. And the pervasiveness of that information, as the professor was saying, the fact that we, are, we know when something happens really far away, it feels like it's next door. So the speed and volume of information is overloading a lot of people. I, I would agree with both of those assessments. I think I would add to that that, um, you know, we, in addition to the so social media since 1998, we did have the 2003 Iraq War which had, and the conflict in Syria, which has spread uh, another narrative that, that terrorist groups have been able to latch on to mobilize their supporters. Um, and then you do also have, the, by using social media and, and, the, and the news cycle, um, you have this kind of copycat thing that happens. It's not surprising, really, that a few months after there was a truck attack followed by a knife attack on Westminster Bridge that somebody tries to replicate that exact same methodology and so you do see that with terrorism in many instances that people will find something that was successful that was low cost that was low intervention in terms of what was required of them and they go out and they do the same thing and the news cycle does contribute to that but but I think fundamentally we need to really um, we, we also need to do a better job of, of analyzing and understanding what's happening in other parts of the world and, and I think really breaking down some of those messages and not coming at it from a place of, of great sort of cultural imperialism because I think that actually does strengthen the hand of, of many of these groups, unfortunately. All right. We've got uh, 30 seconds before we bring back the, uh, uh, the full network. Uh, we have lots more questions. We're going to try to do as many as we can in the six minutes we have uh, remaining, and if I'm going to get to each one of my guests tonight, they'll have to keep that in mind <laughs> as uh, as we move along. But a, a lot of good questions, and, uh, and obviously some uh, some great answers here as well. So let's prepare to bring the uh, the network uh, back in. They'll be joining us in about five seconds from right now. All right, into our final block. We've got six minutes, so let's get right to the questions here. Um, and the first one is for Mubin from Ali Khan Samani asks via Facebook, why is there such a lack of education on the diversity of Muslims? That's a very good question. I think, uh, I think partly that's the fault of the Muslims uh, to, to have people understand that, you know, there are lots of us, there are three million in, or uh, one million in Canada alone. Uh, half of which live in the GTA, and um, that's the Greater Toronto area. Greater Toronto, Toronto area, area right. outside of Toronto. And so I think the problem is that most people just don't realize that we are not one monolithic group. And uh, you know, media entities reinforce that sometimes, politicians and others. And I think uh, we need to get away from that. All right, uh, Stephanie. Question from Twitter: Pavo Burrell. The predictable thoughts and prayers tweets by various leaders like uh, uh, Justin Trudeau are empty and cold, when will real reaction happen? Somebody looking for real, real action against terror. When do you think that's going to happen? Stephanie. Well, I actually think it's important for leaders to convey 
uh, their well wishes when you have a terrorist attack occur. I mean, uh, certainly you don't want the kind of Donald Trump tweets that we've been seeing going forward. This is not the right message to send. In terms of real action, I mean, this question was raised today with Theresa May, who uh, it, over the last, you know, 24 hours has basically said, you know, the time for political correctness uh, or whatever is, is over. Uh, and, you know, the question is, what more legislatively can we actually do? The UK has passed a terrorism bill uh, every two years. We have legislate, you know, there's, they have over 100 statutes in, since 2000 with the word terrorism in the title. So, you know, what real action is, I mean, I think we've had a good conversation tonight about trying to foster better understanding and context uh, as, as a starting point to have a better conversation about terrorism generally. All right. Uh, Saeed, this one's for you. Hayden King asks via Facebook, how should we react to the U.S. government's negative take on for foreigners? Um, well, certainly by the U.S. president uh, of late. Uh, to uh, foreigners who many people would think are their normal allies of the United States. How should we react to this? Well, if I were outside the United States, uh, for example, in Canada, I would implore you not to follow the model that is being presented <laughs> by the American president. And uh, to those who are in the United States, I would similarly uh, remind them that uh, all of us, uh, with the exception of the Native Americans, have migrated to the United States. And certainly here, there have been various times where other uh, immigrant groups, Jews, Catholics, Irish, Poles, uh, have been demonized, uh, of course, along with African Americans. Uh, there, this is part of the history of the United States. It's important to be honest about the history of the United States, but also to recognize that no one is not an immigrant. Uh, no one is not a foreigner to the shores. Sam, this one's for you from Malik Ayas. What can we do as citizens to keep the peace in our cities? And I guess what, what that question is about is, is the peace between diverse groups, the peace between the way we talk to each other, react to each other, certainly on social media at times. What can we do? I don't think it's that complicated, Peter. I think it's about empathy and understanding. I think it's about not reacting to uh, incidents like what's been happening in the United Kingdom from a place of hatred and anger, which will only further those tensions, further those resentments. If there is a time to sort of reach across the aisle and take your neighbor's hand and shake it and introduce yourself properly, um, now's the time. And, uh, and the more that we polarize this conversation, the more we, that we react from a place of, of uh, misunderstanding and resentment and fear, uh, the more we give groups like ISIS the advantage. And we need to remember that they are reacting this way because they're being pressed, because they're being pushed out of Mosul, because they're seeing their territory dwindle. And in, in reality, this is a sign of weakness on their part. It doesn't feel like weakness to us because we experience it firsthand. Um, it is, uh, but nevertheless, I think that now is the time for us to remain, um, just remain, remain who we are, remain true to, to what it means to be Canadian, which is I believe a message of inclusiveness. All right, I've only got a minute left, so this will be quick. But it's a good last question. Why is nobody discussing the root causes of terrorism or the impact of our foreign policy? Moving, you wanna try that? Oh, fantastic, thank you. Uh, great quote. Ideology without grievances doesn't resonate and grievances without ideology are not acted upon. It's the interplay between the two that are the root of terrorism. What would you say, Sam? I mean, I certainly agree. I think that it has been uh, U.S. foreign policy in particular that has resulted um, the Iraq war, uh, especially in 2003, that has led us uh, to, in part, to where we are now, in large part, to where we are now. And so we do have to consider our foreign policy when it comes to how we prevent terrorism over the long term and be investing in the right kind of development activities to ensure that young people in those uh, communities have choices and they have opportunity. Can you answer that in 15 seconds, Stephanie? The only thing I would say, there's a lot of people who disagree with U.S. foreign policy who don't actually mobilize to violence. It, certainly it's a grievance. I, I kind of like M Mubin's phrasing of it, but it's not necessarily a cause. Last word to you, Saeed. Uh, similar length, please. Sure. Connect the dots, follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> Connect the dots That's and follow right. the money. Fantastic. That seems to apply to so many stories right now. <laughs> Listen, we thank you all, Stephanie, Saeed, for joining us from Ottawa and Detroit, and Sam and Mubin here in Toronto. Well, that's all we have time for tonight in terms of questions and answers. We appreciate 
all of your questions, and we'll try to respond to, to many of those who we didn't get to in the days ahead. And of course, our coverage will continue on all platforms on this story. Stay with us now. The National will be back with more news of the day in just a moment. Police in Oakland, California have charged two men in connection with a warehouse fire last year that killed 36 people. One man illegally rented out the space, the other organized a party at the site. Each will face 36 counts of involuntary manslaughter. The building, known as the Ghost Ship, was not zoned for entertainment or residential purposes. Bill Cosby's sexual assault trial began today in suburban Philadelphia. The 79-year-old is accused of drugging and sexually assaulting Canadian Andrea Coston in 2004. Dozens of other women have also come forward with claims against Cosby. But this is expected to be the only criminal trial he will face. If convicted, he could get 10 years in prison. Talk about cutting it close. Bob Dylan has finally delivered a lecture required to keep his Nobel Prize in literature just five days before the deadline for submission. 
In an audio-only recording, the legendary folk singer spoke at length about influential books, including Moby Dick, All Quiet on the Western Front, and The Odyssey. And the themes from those books work their way into many of my songs, either knowingly or unintentionally. He ended the 27-minute lecture on this note. Lyrics and songs are meant to be sung, not read on a page. And I hope some of you get the chance to listen to these lyrics the way they were intended to be heard, in concert or on record, or however people are listening to songs these days. Dylan was named winner of the prize last October, but did not respond for weeks. And he passed on attending the award ceremony in December. Well, here at home, one of the country's major housing markets is experiencing something of a spring chill. Numbers for May indicate a significant change in Toronto. Experts say it's likely a result of new government regulations, and it follows the recent market adjustment in Vancouver. Renee Filipponi now with how it didn't last out west and the consequences of a calmer market. What do you think? Are you ready for a slightly bigger house? This family of three is hoping now is finally the right time to buy. Maybe even a backyard. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, though. Renting for years, they eventually so. want to own, but couldn't stomach it. the crazed market earlier oh, this spring. Good. I'm very happy that we weren't as seriously looking three months ago, because I think we would have just been so put off by the whole process. At open houses over the weekend, Kayla Hache felt a sense of calm. There wasn't a mass of people going in. I felt like it was, the anxiety was taken away. Like I could walk in, there was no pressure. It felt like there wasn't everyone vying for this one house. In the greater Toronto area, the number of active listings rose by nearly 43% compared to last year. Sales are down by more than 20% and prices are falling off their early spring peaks. For a detached home, average prices are up year over year, but down from April, a little more than 5%. Many say it's in response to the provincial government's measures to cool the market, including a foreign buyer's tax and expansion of rent control. It has been in the case in the past that these are just initial jitters and the market would uh, resume to its normal uh, activity in a few months' time. I think we had, had a little bit of a storm. This real estate lawyer says some buyers have been caught in the market swing and could be on the hook for tens of thousands of dollars unable to close deals they made when the market was red hot. There are situations now where people who bought first and are now trying to sell, they bought before the government announcements, now they're trying to sell, they're having some difficulty selling for the price they thought they would get in order to afford the new home. A knee-jerk reaction or proper market cool down, no one can say for sure. Vancouver saw a similar response following the introduction of its foreign buyer's tax nine months ago. But sales numbers and prices out there are now back at near record levels. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Toronto. Well, like Toronto's housing numbers, today's financial markets were also trending down. The TSX fell 32 points. The Canadian dollar bucked the trend. It gained an eighth of a cent. South of the border, the Dow lost 22 points. The price of oil was down 26 cents a barrel. This Thunder Bay homeless shelter says it was thrilled when it received a $10,000 donation towards its street outreach campaign. But it actually tried to give it back. Here's why. The gift came from a man who is homeless himself. He had recently received compensation through the residential school settlement program. The man, who wants to remain anonymous, insisted the shelter take it because he wanted to make sure his friends would be safe and healthy. Before we go tonight, a look at a story we'll bring you tomorrow about a face you may know, but a family's pain you may not. This is from when he was really teeny. Yeah. Eh? I'm Red Sharon with a story of love. You're only as happy as your unhappiest child. The most comforting nights of our lives were when we knew he was safe and when he was in rehab. The story of addiction. He left her apartment and walked up to a bar, walked right into the bathroom, shot up the rest of the heroin and just hit the floor and died. End of loss. 
Well, you know, you have holes in your hearts that will never heal. That describes Anne and I and Darcy perfectly. But, um, you know, we, uh, we miss him every day, but we, you know, you go on. You know, having everybody out here supporting. How one very high profile family is coping with the death of a son and brother lost to addiction. Just think you're filling this place four times over in your, in your brother's memory. How's that feel? That feels really good actually, yeah. When, when you put it that way, that uh, makes it more meaningful than just doing a regular show, right? Yeah, uh, he'd be pretty proud of you, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. And what they are doing to try and help others. We just got this and we're very excited about it. So. In Bruce's memory, tomorrow on The National. That is The National for this Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.